Welcome friends. Antenatal markers and its significance is the topic which we are going to discuss today. It's a rarely touched topic but there are many questions asked on this. So from your entrance examination point of view this topic is very important. Let's see how much we can cover today. This board shows that there are certain defects which are structural and certain chromosomal for which we have certain markers if we do those evaluations, they can guide us whether those abnormalities are present in the fetus or not. Some are screening tests which tell us whether the patient is for high risk or low risk of having those abnormalities and some are confirmatory tests. So let's go through this. There are risk factors for having chromosomal or structural abnormalities. What are those risk factors? Maternal age more than 35 year is a big risk factor for having chromosomal abnormalities and most common chromosomal abnormality would be trisomy 21 that is Down syndrome and we all know that Down syndrome babies they have mental retardation, scholastic backwardness, there is a wide spectrum and they live a long life maybe till 60 years. So then in the present scenario where there are nuclear families Taking care of a child who is mentally retarded is very difficult. And again in India we don't have much of social groups available to support these kind of children. So then it is our duty to screen every couple or a female who is pregnant for such kind of abnormalities. And if they are there, if we can detect them, then termination is the only solution. We cannot really correct them but termination of that pregnancy in time saves giving birth to such kind of children. Previous child with any structural defect or chromosomal abnormality again puts the couple or the mother at higher risk of having the same abnormality or different kind of abnormality again. Previous unexplained stillbirth or neonatal death, she is again at risk. Consanguinity. If the couple has consanguinity, the marriage is consanguinous, they have more chances of having chromosomal abnormalities. If there are medical disorders in the mother, like diabetes mellitus, diabetes, if it is uncontrolled, it gives rise to many structural abnormalities. Most common are heart diseases or neural tube defects. And specific neural tube defects are caudal regression syndrome and sacral agenesis. So if diabetes is uncontrolled, whenever she conceives at that time, if the HP A1C levels are very raised or the sugar levels are very high then the fetus is likely to have structural abnormalities. Again exposure to teratogen, ionizing radiation, viral infections, many drugs like thalidomide they will lead to structural abnormalities and irrespective of this every patient who conceives she has two to three percent chances of having a structural or chromosomally abnormal child. Some defects can be just, they are taking place at the time of conception. We cannot predict them and that patient may not have any risk factor. Now here we have said that maternal age more than 35 increases the risk of chromosomal abnormalities. But trisomy 21 can also be seen in a primary who conceives at 18 years of age. So every time we cannot predict, that is why we should have some screening tests if that test is offered to that patient, the pregnant lady, that will tell us that whether she is high risk or low risk for that particular abnormality. What are the antenatal markers for this screening test? Maternal serum alpha pitoprotein level. I don't know but this is such an important thing from exam point of view that you have to remember each and every reason of increase of maternal serum alpha protein levels or decrease of MSAFP. It's a very important marker. It tells us about neural tube defects, abdominal tube defects. We are going to see it in detail. Then beta HCG, PAPE, maternal serum estradiol levels, amniotic fluid acetylcholinesterase, pseudocholine or butylcholinesterase, NABIN A. All these things are very important markers which will tell us whether they have any structural, the common structural defects or any chromosomal defects. Now let's see one by one. Maternal serum alpha-fetoprotein 
it is first secreted by the yolk sac then by the liver and GIT of the fetus. Highest level in fetal serum around 13 weeks, in amniotic fluid around 30 weeks but in maternal serum the highest level are attained at 28 to 32 weeks. Alpha phytoprotein starts coming earlier but the highest level is at that time. The tests done, they should be done before the period of abortion. Like all the screening test or the confirmatory test should be done before 20 weeks because Indian law allows us to terminate the pregnancy only till 20 weeks. So we should have a screening test which can be done either in first trimester or in early second trimester so that we can confirm by confirmatory test whether the fetus has certain abnormalities and then we can decide whether the patient should continue the pregnancy or discontinue the pregnancy. So all the tests would be in this range before 20 weeks. The highest value would be 2.5 multiples of median that is mom as a cutoff for MSAFP. Now elevated levels of MSAFP. Now let's see how, how this uh, reaches maternal serum. Actually it is getting secreted by the fetus. The fetus urine contains MSAFP. So that gets and through placental circulation it comes into maternal circulation. And after 13 weeks, the level starts rising up. The tests which are done are around 15 weeks so that these levels can be found. If they are elevated or if they are decreased, what are the reasons we can see? Now, which are the conditions where there would be elevated levels but those are physiological? Multiple gestation, low birth weight baby and decreased maternal weight. You have to remember all these things because I think there are 20 plus MCQs only on MSAFP levels. And all the conditions are asked in different different MCQs in different manner or in different ways. Pathologically elevated levels of MSAFP. It is seen in neural tube defect, abdominal wall defects in the form of omphalocele or gastroschiasis, congenital skin defects, cystic hygroma liver necrosis, extrophy of cloaca, atresia or obstruction that is esophageal or intestinal, nephrosis, congenital renal anomalies like agenesis, polycystic kidneys, infection with B, uh, parvovirus B19, osteogenesis imperfecta, sacrococcygeal teratoma. In all these conditions, there would be raised level of MSAFP. What are the conditions where the levels are low? chromosomal that is trisomy, gestational trophoblastic tumor there would be low levels, blighted ovum, increased maternal weight and again an important thing is overestimated gestational age in that the levels would be low because it goes on increasing so if we have overestimated so in comparison to the uh, age the gestational age the levels would be low. So you have to remember all these reasons I think I would suggest make a chart and put it in front of your study table or something and keep looking at the chart because you cannot afford to forget any of these reasons. All MCQs if you see they have given four questions and one abnormal thing, one option out of five options, four options which are there and one which is exceptional or which is not there and all the reasons of elevated levels have been covered but most concentration in on neural tube defect and the abdominal wall defect. There are two defects abdominal wall, omphalocele and gastroschiasis. One MCQ is like this that maximum level will be seen in whom? In spina bifida occulta or omphalocele or gastroschiasis. Now in this we can say that in spina bifida occulta there is a sac so the transmission of serum alpha phytoprotein from fetus to mother would be less because it's occulta. In comparison with omphalocele and gastroschiasis, omphalocele has a sac but gastroschiasis the abdominal wall is absent. There is a paramedian umbilical defect and the intestines are free floating outside. So in this case maximum alpha phytoprotein will reach to the maternal circulation and the levels would be high. So to this extent there are questions on alpha phytoprotein levels. Again there is one MCQ which, which says that if the ma maternal serum alpha phytoproteins levels are less then how to evaluate further. 
should we repeat the test again or should we go for some other test so no need of repeating the test again low levels they are suggestive of either trisomy or blighted ovum or mole increased maternal weight is well, let's keep it aside or overestimation of gestational age these are the reasons of low level of msfp so that tells us that instead of repeating the test if we go for a simple level 1 ultrasound that will rule out molar pregnancy that will exclude molar because baby would be seen if there is fetal pore present if fetal heart is seen then that rules out blighted ovum as well and it will also give us accurate measurement of the gestational age of the fetus so overestimation will also be ruled out so in case if there are low levels of maternal serum alpha fetoprotein then we should go ahead with a level 1 ultrasound scan it will rule out all the other options and tell us whether the fetus is normal the dates are adequate fetus is live or not then in case everything is normal means the baby is normal it's not blighted over then we should think of chromosomal tri trisomies so then we can advise the patient to go for amniocentesis by amniocentesis the amniotic fluid which surrounds the baby is taken out and sent for karyotyping it contains fetal cells skin cells the cells from the respiratory tract whatever fibroblast we can collect they are cultured and karyotyping is done that will tell us whether the fetus has chromosomal abnormality or no. So if there is presence of abnormality, then we can decide on termination. If there is not no or there is absence of chromosomal abnormality and the maternal serum alpha fetoprotein levels are less, less than 2.5 moms, then we have to, there are chances of spontaneous abortion or hereditiform mole or choriocarcinoma. But again, on ultrasound, we have ruled out thyroidiform mold. So, we have to just warn the patient that this pregnancy may get aborted because the levels are low. So, the MCQ, about one or two will just cover. MSAFP is increased in all except. So, as I told you, the options are variable. Open neural tube defect, meningomyelocele, spina bifida and trisomy. So, what will, you, what will be the answer? The answer is trisomy because you know open neural tube defect the levels would be high meningomyelocele again it's a neural tube defect levels will be high spina bifida NTD neural tube defect levels would be high the question is MSFP levels would be increased in all except so only in trisomy the levels decrease so the right answer is trisomy now the another question in pregnancy with increased maternal serum alpha protein, phytoprotein level which of the following should be done first should we repeat the measurement of M msafp at later date should we go for usg should we go for amniocentesis directly or should we ask the patient to terminate the pregnancy so as we have seen repeat levels it will not be much useful because they will be again increased amniocentesis directly going for amniocentesis is not a wise decision because we need to, by exclusion, we have to come to this point that whether we are suspecting trisomy. So if we have to do first ultrasound, that will rule out molar pregnancy, that will rule out blighted ovum, that will also rule out overestimation of the age. Then we have the option left is whether there is uh, trisomy present or not. In that case, to confirm the presence of trisomy, we can go for amniocentesis. As understand that amniocentesis is a process in which we take out amniotic fluid from the uterine cavity by putting a needle inside the uterine cavity. In pregnancy, we don't like to put needles because it has risk. It's an invasive test. So it has a risk of abortion almost 0.5%. So in that case, it is we, if we have to advise amniocentesis, we should rule out other causes. That is why it would be better that we go for ultrasound first, then once it suggests, then only amniocentesis will be avoided and termination of pregnancy should not be advised just because the patient has increased MSAFP levels. Now coming to the second marker that is maternal beta-HCG. The source is syncytiotrophoblast of placenta, detection in normal urine or plasma, pregnant woman 8 to 10 days following ovulation shows presence of this hormone. 
maximum level is obtained at 8 to 10 weeks of gestation and nadir reaches at 20 weeks pitaisuji elevated levels are seen in multifetal pregnancy or twin gestation rh incompatibility that is erythroblastosis fetalis down syndrome choriocarcinoma hereditary mole so in these cases the levels are very high and decreased levels are seen in ectopic pregnancy impending spontaneous abortion again you have to remember this a question may be asked that decreased level of beta hcg are seen in yes this is the question and the options given are down syndrome hereditary form mole multiple pregnancy and ectopic pregnancy so what would be the answer the answer is ectopic pregnancy as in multiple pregnancy the levels will be high in h mole the levels will be high and even in down syndrome beta hcg levels are high so in trisomy 21 msfp levels decreases but beta hcg levels they increase let's move to the other marker that is maternal serum estradiol source of this is fetal adrenal glands the substrate of estradiol is dehydroepiandrosterone made by fetal adrenal glands this is metabolized in placenta to estradiol it gives an indication of general well-being of fetus but estriol levels tend to be lower in down syndrome and in adrenal hypoplasia so it can be used to screen for trisomy 21 because the levels are found to be low in comparison with normal pregnancies inhibin a source corpus luteum and placenta inhibin a levels are found to be raised in case of down syndrome what they have done is they have studied normal pregnancy inhibin levels and if patient is having or someone is having downs baby then what are the blood levels of inhibin a in that particular patient and then they have done the comparison and found that in pregnancy with down syndrome the levels of inhibin a are elevated in comparison with normal pregnancies other marker which is quite practically useful is pape the long form is pregnancy associated plasma protein a it's the largest protein source is placenta syncytiotrophoblast it is used as a screening test for trisomy 21 the levels of pape they decrease in trisomy 21 in comparison with normal pregnancy level of pape rises from initial level at about 32 days after ovulation and then increases rapidly doubling every three days Electroimmunoassay allowed detection as early as fifth week this is a very sophisticated test of pape detection but sensitivity is also very high so that is why it is used in screening of chromosomal defects acetylcholinesterase another marker better diagnostic value than afp amniotic fluid acetylcholine levels are increased in most open neural tube defect it differentiates between neural tube defect and abdominal wall defect because afp is raised in both of them so we need some marker which will differentiate in this so acetylcholine levels are increased in neural tube defect and are decreased in abdominal wall defect so it is helpful there pseudocholinesterase also known as butyl cholinesterase it is useful in patients with elevated amniotic fluid afp to differentiate between NTD and abdominal wall defect. If we compare the level of these two, acetylcholinesterase is high in neural tube defect and low in abdominal wall defect. Pseudocholinesterase is low in neural tube defect and high in abdominal wall defect. Now let's go trimester wise. What are the trimester the screening tests available for chromosomal abnormalities? First trimester screening, we have NT plus hormonal testing from 11 to 14 weeks of pregnancy USG scan called nuchal translucency scan can be done nuchal translucency is a translucent area behind the nape of the neck of the fetus this is fluid under skin at baby's neck and it can be measured and that level or uh, the thickness of this neural trans nuchal translucency is suggestive 
of whether the baby has Down syndrome or other abnormalities. This test can be combined with other two markers to increase the sensitivity. So this test is combined with beta HCG. The levels are increased in case of uh, trisomies, trisomy 21 and PAPE is also added where the levels are decreased. So if we compare this sensitivity, NT scan alone gives a sensitivity of 75 to 82 percent. Blood test alone gives sensitivity of 60 to 70 percent. But if we combine, like today, that is called as OSCAR, that one stop clinical risk assessment, in which at the same time the scan is done, the levels of nuchal translucency are given to the software, and patient's blood is taken for these two markers, and the levels will be added. Age of the patient, other parameters including weight and race and everything is also given to the software and the software calculates the risk and tells us. So when we add nuchal translucency to the two markers, then the risk or the sensitivity of the test increases to almost 90 to 93%. Some claim even 96% sensitivity. This was from 11 weeks to 14 weeks because the time to measure the NT is ideal in that particular phase. The baby's size, CRL and baby's position is adequate to measure NT at that particular time. After that, it becomes difficult to have the baby in that particular position where we can measure the NT. Coming to second trimester screening test, we have either triple marker or quadruple marker test. So blood test is done at 15 to 20 weeks of pregnancy and the markers used are beta HCG, estriol, AFP and inhibin A. It, there is double marker is the beta HCG in PAPE test, triple marker where inhibin A is not included and quadruple is where inhibin A is included to the above mentioned markers. Let's see this test, triple test. It is combined measurement of MSAFP, beta HCG and U3 that is estriol levels, unconjugated estriol used for detection of Down syndrome, trisomy 13, 18 and NTD perform in between 15 to 18 weeks. In Down syndrome, AFP levels are decreased, HCG level have increased and estriol levels decreased. In Edward, AFP decreases, HCG also decreases and estriol also decreases. In NTDs, AFP increases HCG and U estriol levels will be normal. Anencephaly, AFP will be increased and HCG and estriol will be decreased. So once you give these levels to the software, they will calculate the risk for having trisomy 21. The risk would be, the cutoff would be 1 in 250. If the risk is more than 250, then the patient is advised confirmatory tests like amniocentesis or cord blood sampling. If the risk is less than 1 in 250, then the patient is told as she falls in low risk group and then the confirmatory test may not be necessary. So this is triple test. Quadruple test, it involves measurement of inhibin along with these three markers. Again performed at 15 to 18 weeks. It detects trisomy 21 in 80% of affected pregnancies. Triple test has sensitivity almost around 60 to 65%. MSFP is decreased, beta HCG increased during estriol decreased and inhibin A increased in trisomy. These tests can be used sequentially and the total risk can be calculated or we can integrate risk of first trimester and second trimester screening and that is called as serum integrated test means we will give information to the software of first trimester screening as well as second trimester screening and at the end depending on all the levels the software will give us what is the particular risk of that particular patient of having chromosomal abnormality if she falls in low risk we do the counseling that you are in low risk that doesn't mean you have a guarantee that you don't have any chromosomal abnormality it is up to you to decide whether you want to go for the confirmatory test but if she falls in high risk then we have to tell her tell her that you fall in high risk group that's why it is advisable that you go for confirmatory test and we are going to see what are the confirmatory tests which tell us 
whether the fetus has chromosomal abnormality or not. Let's stop here and in next session we will see what are the other tests available as antenatal markers for structural and chromosomal abnormalities.